Shatt. Uh, Dr. Shatt is an associate professor of dermatology at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. She serves as a residency program director, chief of dermatology at the Louisville VA Hospital and dermatology clerkship director for the University of Louisville Division of Dermatology. Dr. Shad is dedicated to resident education and academic dermatology, serving on the board of directors for the Association of Professors of Dermatology and the University of Louisville GME Office Graduate Medical Education Accreditation Committee. In addition, she enjoys writing and giving lectures and is the patient page editor for JAMA Dermatology. Dr. Shad completed medical school and dermatology residency at the Vanderbilt uh, University School of Medicine. She practices general and medical dermatology and has a particular interest in autoimmune connective tissue disease and inflammatory disorders of the skin. So let's welcome Dr. Shep. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I actually changed my topic last week with permission of the organizers of this meeting from skin signs of internal disease to COVID-19 and the skin. So I thought this would be a more timely, uh, relevant topic, and hopefully you all will find this interesting and helpful. I have no <laughs> conflicts of interest or relevant disclosures. And so just to start, um, the skin has always been a window to the body. And we know that the skin can be very helpful in helping us diagnose lots of different diseases, including infectious disease. And on the upper left, you know, we have the classic smallpox eruption, on the bottom left, we have the, uh, the hand rash of secondary syphilis, which is definitely making a comeback. And then on the upper right, we have primary varicella or chickenpox. We have the different stages of vesicles healing. It would also be really nice if the skin could help us with COVID. So my goal today is to review the literature on the skin signs of, of COVID-19 describe these for you so you can help recognize, is there a definitive association? What about timing related to the COVID infection? Does it help us predict disease severity and children versus adults, is there a difference? So I'm gonna start with a case. This was a case of one of my colleagues. This was actually a patient who was referred to her a few weeks ago, a 39 year old woman with skin discoloration and swelling on her hands and feet for about a week. She had a lot of joint pain as well and these lesions were very tender. Her husband had actually tested positive for COVID a month prior. The patient had had similar symptoms, including fever and cough, but had tested negative times two via PCR. She was otherwise healthy. Her medications were calcium and multivitamin, and she had been started one day prior on prednisone and meloxicam. So to give you an idea of what, yeah, what her skin looked like. So these are a little more subtle on the feet, so I have some arrows here to help you out. But she had these kind of violaceous plaques, subcutaneous plaques on her feet. And her hands, I think you can definitely see significant edema over the MCP and PIP joints and these very tender, violaceous nodules and plaques. So her PCP had checked um, a negative ANA, negative ANCA. Her inflammatory markers were elevated, including the sed rate and CRP. Her CBC, CMP were normal. She had normal levels of rheumatoid factor and CCCP and CCP antibodies. And a biopsy was performed that day and showed really kind of nonspecific dermal and subcutaneous inflammation. So what are we gonna do with this? And I think many of you are gonna be asked by, regardless of what your specialty is, you will have family members and other people who may ask you, is this skin rash? Is there something about COVID? And I think the, the media has also um, really helped project this into popular popularity among everybody today, that COVID toes, we hear a lot about um, severe rashes associated with COVID. So I think it's really important that all of us recognize um, what, how the skin can potentially help us and what it can predict with the disease. So the very first description of the skin involving COVID came out of the New England Journal article that describes over a thousand patients from 552 hospitals in China, and majority of those patients had fever and cough, and two patients, only two, so 0.2%, were described as having a rash. Um, they both were described as having severe disease, but we have no idea what that rash was. The first article that actually looked at the skin came out of Italy in May of 2020, and it was about 148 patients who actually had confirmed COVID, and they actually excluded 60 patients who had started any new medication in the previous 15 days in case the medication was the cause of the rash and found that a 20% had a new unknown rash 
eight percent or eight patients had had that at the time of the symptoms versus the other 10 developed the rash after they'd been admitted. And 14 of these patients had what we call an erythematous rash. Three had urticaria, one had chicken pox like vesicles, but we have no pictures, we have no other information. And then the American Academy of Dermatology, along with um, Harvard and Mass General and an international um, dermatology European association created this International Registry of COVID-19 Cutaneous Manifestations. And this is actually the actual link for that registry that is active. And this is open to medical professionals from any specialty. And they actually collected the data from April to May and 716 cases were submitted from a variety of countries. Only 171 of those cases actually had confirmed COVID-19. And of those confirmed, the average age was 44, more women than men. 22% had a morbilliform rash, 18% had a perineal-like rash, 16% had urticaria, and then there's a variety of other rashes. Now, who submitted the cases? So 54% were dermatologists, 32% were other specialists, and then the remaining percentage were um, included mid-level providers, nurses, and other medical professionals. 89% of these came out of the US. They were really unable to determine the duration of the rashes because 72% of them had an ongoing rash at the end of the study. And the majority of patients had received multiple different treatments for COVID-19 prior to this rash starting. And we only have 14 biopsies from the confirmed cases and most did not submit pictures. So before I throw more words at you, and I'm sure all of you realize that in dermatology, we have our own language in a lot of ways. We throw out a lot of terminology, and, and it's really important that you actually understand what I'm talking about when I describe these rashes. So we're going to actually open up a poll, and I would love for everyone to just kind of give me their honest answer. Do you feel confident diagnosing perneo? And this is a yes or no question. All right, so I'm gonna wait for them to put the results up. Let's see. Oh, wow, <laughs> okay, this is why we're talking about it today. All right, we're gonna move on to the next one. Uh, what about petechiae and purpura? Yes or no? All right. I'll show those results. Okay, so we feel much better about petechia and purpura, it sounds like. Okay, all right. Uh, sorry. Okay, what about a morbilliform rash? And I'm gonna cheat here or make it easier for you and tell you maculopapular is also okay. So how about that? All right, see what we got here. Okay, this is a little less confidence than the petechia and purpura. So petechia and purpura have won so far the contest. And then prior to my slide, have you actually heard of retiform purpura before? So I had it on a slide earlier. All right, let's see what we got for results here. Okay, so 15% have heard of it. All right, well, good. So that's why I'm here today to talk to you about the skin. So just to give you an example, this is what some people call maculopapular or morbilliform. It was called morbilliform to describe the rash after with a measles infection, but this is actually a really common drug eruption that we see, and it's just bright red erythematous papules. They can coalesce. It can be also more flat macules. It loves the trunk. And so this is something we see from infections, but we also see this with a lot of medications. Another key point to remember is that rashes look different in, in patients of different skin types. And one of my biggest critiques of our literature is that we don't have enough pictures of patients who have different skin types with different rashes. Because as you can see, this morbilliform eruption actually looks more violaceous and darker skinned individuals compared to the bright red erythema of the previous patient. Now, perneo. So perneo is also called chillblains, just to make it more complicated. So you've got two names. 
And we see this not infrequently in dermatology, but what it is, is where you develop these kind of painful, tender, kind of burny, sometimes itchy, erythematous papules or little nodules, or even blisters on the feet or the hands with cold exposure. So you actually get inflammation of the blood vessels. It can be idiopathic. So again, we see this in the winter time frequently, but it also can be seen with other autoimmune, with other autoimmune conditions like lupus. And here's a, a child who has popsicle paniculitis. So this child is totally healthy, but they kept that popsicle on that one cheek for too long and they actually developed pernio on that cheek. So you can see it, healthy individuals. And here's more of a closer up view of what it can look like, almost vesicular, almost blistery looking. And we know that if patients have these beyond the regular cold season, then they have a higher chance of an underlying systemic illness. So vesicular, pseudovesicular, just to remind the audience, vesicle means a clear filled fluid bump. And sometimes the skin can be so edematous that it's hard to tell, is it actually a vesicle or not? And this is actually a patient with a viral exanthem. And this is not COVID, this was years ago from a patient, um, but this is something that this can look like. Chicken pox is uh, vesicular, but they're in different stages of healing. And then urticaria is the fancy term for hives, which I'm sure all of you have seen at some point, but just remember that they can look like a variety of shapes, they're itchy, and they, one individual hive does not stay there in that same area for more than 24 hours. They move around. And then petechia and purpura, the group sounded pretty confident, but just remember this is inflammation of the superficial, the smaller vesicles, vessels in the skin. And so petechia are small, and when they coalesce, you get palpable purpura. These are two different patients of mine with vasculitis. The one on the left has mixed cryoglobulinemia. The one on the right has um, IJ vasculitis. And then finally, we're gonna talk about briefly, this is an example of livido. So livido is this reticulated pattern where you have compromised blood flow to the medium-sized blood vessels in the skin. So you get this downstream kind of duskiness. And if it becomes severe enough that you actually get vascular occlusion, you get rediform purpura, which is the picture on the right, where you actually get loss of, you get death of the, of the skin. And so you're actually getting necrosis, um, you get blood leakage. So this, is, this tells you that those blood vessels are actually have blockage, whether that be deposition, inflammation, et cetera. So I'm gonna go back to the studies. And so there was a study actually out of China and Italy um, of 678 patients, all with PCR confirmed COVID. 53% of these patients, so it's a lower percentage than what that registry showed, but 7.8% developed some type of new rash. And the majority of these patients had a morbilliform eruption. Um, about a fourth had urticaria, and a small percentage had a chickenpox-like rash. And about 44% of patients had a rash at the time of their COVID diagnosis, while Actually, a greater number developed a rash during their hospitalization, about 11.4, 11.7 days after being admitted. Most of these rashes did tend to be very mild and self-limiting. However, in the patients with the more petechiae and purpura, these patients tended to be sick, and they also had acquired coagulopathies. Another study, which is pretty cool out of Spain, they actually asked all the Spanish dermatologists over a two week period to enroll all patients with a new unexplained skin eruption with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. And they took pictures for the most of these patients and had them independent, independently verified by four dermatologists. And then their final sample, they had 375 patients. 19% uh, had pernio, like lesions. They tend to be on the feet more than the hands. 9% um, had vesicular, 19% uh, had hives. Um, 47%, so again, the largest percentage of patients had that morbilliform eruption, and about 6% had that livido or necrosis. And I think most importantly from this study is that they looked at symptoms, they looked at ICU status, et cetera, and on the left, you can see that the patients who had this perio or pseudo chilblains were actually younger their rash lasted longer for about 13 days versus on the far right, the patients who had the livido or the necrosis were older and they were much sicker and they a much higher percentage were um, in the ICU. And then vesicular, urticarial, maculopapular were all kind of in between. So the way that I think about this, and this is um, adapted from um, a, that publication, is there's really just two big categories that have been described with COVID-19. 
We have our kind of inflammatory, um, exanthematous, which are nonspecific, but like morbilliform, maculopapular, urticarium vesicular. And then we have our vascular ones. We have our pernio, which is our benign, but then we have the livido and the purpura. So those are the ones we're more concerned about. So these are just some examples of some patients with, co with confirmed COVID-19 who had eruptions. This was considered a morbilliform. The one on the right was more follicular and more in that category. And the vesicular, it's very hard to see on these pictures, but these were actually individual vesicles that were exactly the same, scattered on the trunk. And you can see the hand, how edematous they are. These are some patients who had more of an urticarial rash. And you can definitely see these looked more edematous. And the one on the right in particular is different shapes and really looks like kind of classic hives. And so the, the key point here is that morbilliform has been the most frequently described skin eruption associated with COVID-19. It is difficult, however, at this point to really separate that out from all the different medications that patients have been given over their hospitalization. So we've seen it, but it, we don't have enough evidence yet to know is it truly associated with COVID. Um, but it does tend to be self-resolving and not severe. Vesicular eruptions are our case reports, but again, we see vesicular eruptions with lots of viruses. And then urticaria has also been reported as a presenting sign, and can, but that can also occur with any kind of infection. It's, it's, an, it's a reactive phenomenon is the way I can give it. So I think the key is, is that you just wanna keep your mind open. And if patients come in with any of these weird rashes, you wanna think about it, um, but it doesn't def definitively mean that's it. So COVID toes. So here are some pictures and you can see these look identical to the pictures of hernia that I showed you earlier. So this was a cool study. They took a small study of seven pediatric patients with new hernia like lesions. All, all, um, all the patients actually had negative testing and they obtained seven biopsies and every biopsy showed positive staining for the SARS-CoV-2 protein in the endothelial cell. And they actually showed of viral particles on electron microscopy. And here's a picture. So you're gonna see on the top, you have the COVID, the, the perneo lesions. And then the bottom left, you have where, the, where it's more kind of brown staining is the actual positive spike protein for the SARS-CoV-2. And then on the right, you see the little arrow pointing out the little um, virus. So it's, that's a pretty cool study. However, other studies haven't replicated this yet. There was a study of 20 children from Spain who had idiopathic perineal-like lesions, and all of them were negative. And what they found with these children that 75% of these children were walking around their house barefoot during the pandemic, and only two of them actually had a, a home heating system. And then another study from Belgium with 31 patients, most were teenagers and young adults, all of them tested negative and none of their biopsies showed the staining for the virus. So I think with perineal-like lesions, is it definitively linked? Remains to be determined. There are three, three kind of theories that have been proposed for this. And it may be that patients actually did have COVID-19, but it's just such a, it's a subacute manifestation of the infection, there's no longer any detectable viral particles. It may be that they had such a small viral inoculum that's just a false negative PCR. These patients are all the ones that tend to be mildly symptomatic. It's also been shown that younger patients do have a lower serologic response, so we're just not gonna see that. And in one study of 40 patients with perineal-like lesions, all of them were PCR negative, but 30% end up having positive antibodies. But other articles have proposed that it's actually the quarantine itself, and that people are at home not wearing shoes and they're more sedentary. And then it's also been thought, well, maybe the widespread media coverage, so we just have increased reporting of perneo. And I, I tend to think it's probably a combination of all of these because some of these cases have come out when it was warm and it wasn't winter. Um, so again, it's just an interesting, interesting thought. So I think if someone presents to you with perineal-like lesions, I think it's very reasonable to work them up for COVID. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that what we've seen is that these tend to be younger, healthier patients who have very mild disease. And they can take a long time to go away. It can take several weeks and they can last way past the symptoms. And you do need to make sure though that they don't have other things going on, not assume it's COVID, right? We don't wanna assume that's what it is. And these patients can be treated with um, potent topical steroids and make sure they're wearing warm socks, especially as we head into the, the winter. So let's move on to the purpura and the livido-like lesions. So these are some examples of patients with COVID-19 that had um, more purpura, kind of rediform look to them. 
And the first vascular involvement of the skin that was reported was a case of immune thrombocytopenic purpura in a patient with COVID-19. And you can see those beautiful petechiae there. It's very classic for petechiae. So this was an interesting study. So they actually looked, and so we, we know pernio is involving blood vessels, but those patients aren't sick. And then we have purpura and livido, which involves blood vessels. Those patients are sick. So this study actually compared the microscopic findings, their cytokine profile, looked at their SARS protein expression, and they compared the perneo patients to the livido and the retiform purpura patients. And what they found was in the perneo patients, they had highly, in their skin biopsies, it was highly inflammatory, but they had very minimal vessel injury, and they had more of a type 1 interferon signaling. However, in the patients who had retiform purpura, they actually had very little inflammation, but instead had vascular thrombosis, and they had a lot of complement deposition and SARS-CoV-2 protein um, expression in the blood vessels. And they actually then, at an, in a subsequent study, compared the lung tissue of patients who had died from COVID respiratory failure, and they actually found that the lung tissue looked identical to what these retiform purpura look like. So we think that these are the same process affecting the skin and the lungs and likely other organs as well. This is actually a picture of a, of a blood vessel that's actually clotted in a patient with COVID-19. And so I think, you know, retiform purpura for dermatologists is always not a good sign. So bottom line is if you at least have learned to recognize a new morphology, you should always, this patient should be very concerning to you whether or not it's COVID or not. Um, but these are the patients that are um, thought to be, have a high risk for respiratory failure. Um, and it's thought that this is a complement mediated microvascular injury. We know these patients are older and have a poor prognosis. There's actually clots and they actually have acquired clotting disorders as well. So anytime you see a vascular type pattern in someone's skin, please don't hesitate to think about COVID, but they also need to be worked up for other things. And just to kind of give you the, I thought this was a nice uh, picture. We have perneo on the left. Um, that tends to be younger patients, not as many hospitalized. It can be painful, it can be itchy. We have retiform purpura on the right, and those are our sick patients, older. We really are concerned about those. And then we have our more kind of non-specific, but more biliform, urticarial, vesicular eruptions in the middle, which are kind of more medium, so not as bad. So, um, I'm going to finish up with multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So in May, there was a cluster of eight children in the United Kingdom who reported to have this hyperinflammatory shock that really resembled Kawasaki disease or atypical Kawasaki or toxic shock. Um, majority of these children were black. Five out of eight were boys. Um, seven out of eight were well above the 75th percentile for their weight. And four out of eight had had a known exposure with a confirmed first degree relative who had COVID-19. None of them actually tested positive for the PCR, um, but they presented with fever, rash, conjunctivitis, peripheral edema, severe GI symptoms. And two of them actually tested positive post-discharge, one of those post-mortem, and one of them died from an, inf an infarct. And then since then, a lot more reports have appeared out of Italy, United States, United Kingdom. Interestingly enough, none have come out of Asia and are some features similar to Kawasaki, but what they found is that's different is that these children tend to be older. They tend to be nine years is the average age, but there have been teenagers reported with this. Um, the black and Hispanic population is overrepresented and most of these patients really are healthy baseline. And most of these patients in these additional studies all tested positive for the, either for PCR or antibody. And so the, the key thing with this is that these patients present it with fever, but they also present it with GI symptoms. And so we're not going to be thinking GI and COVID, but in these patients it, it was. And they had kind of a nonspecific rash, they had the conjunctival injection, injection, they had a lot of other lymphadenopathy, they did have some mild respiratory symptoms, but the complications include shock, myocardial dysfunction, kidney injury, hepatitis. And um, there are just some that met full criteria for Kawasaki, some that didn't, but they all needed cardiac evaluation. And so just to remind everyone, if you haven't thought about Kawasaki for a long time, this is the eruption that there's criteria, but includes conjunctival injection, 
oral mucous membrane changes. They can have red fissured lips. They can have a strawberry tongue. They also can get peripheral edema. And then later on, they just shed their skin, um, particularly on the hands and feet. Polymorphous rash means it can look like anything. And then cervical lymphadenopathy. And so here's some pictures of the peripheral edema on the left. And then we have more of that dust squamation that's later on in disease um, on the right. And here's just the bright red lips of a kid with Kawasaki. And just, I thought this was a nice little graph. So I think the things to think about is when you're talking about children in acute COVID-19, most kids are gonna have a mild disease, but it's gonna be severe like it is in adults if they have an underlying medical condition. However, when you get to this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, some of them may just be febrile, some of them may really resemble Kawasaki disease, and then some of them can go on with cardiac involvement with really severe complications. And then I have a few slides left. Um, this is a report that have actually been reports in adults now too. So as, as a lot of, some of us just take care, pri take care primarily of adults, we wanna remember this has actually been seen in those more recently, a series of 16 patients. These were younger adults, 21 to 47, all but one were black or Hispanic and all had a positive PCR antibody testing for COVID-19. And really very minimal respiratory symptoms. Eight of them had had a typical COVID symptoms two to five weeks prior, but eight had zero preceding symptoms. But 10 out of them actually did have findings on X-ray and they all had some type of cardiac abnormality as a complication. And most of them had GI symptoms similar to the children on admission. Most of them did survive, fortunately, and they were treated in similar ways as the children were um, for Kawasaki with IVIG, tocilizumab. So just to summarize this, um, we have a lot to learn and a lot to see going forward, but I think keep your eyes out for Pernio. We don't have a yet a definitive diagnosis, but I think that we will see that, especially as we head into the winter months, we probably will see more patients coming in for it. Um, but the good thing is this tends to be less sick patients. If you see anything purpuric, Anything like that, you want to think about, um, really be concerned. And then multi-system inflammatory disorder, these patients may not have any respiratory symptoms. They may have more GI symptoms, but it'd be a complication of COVID. And then I'm going to skip real quick. I'm just going to show this last slide here because all of us are wearing masks a lot. And as a dermatologist, of course, I just want to remind everyone that if your skin is becoming irritated with wearing masks, um, you can consider an alcohol-free barrier, wipe or spray, you can Google those, and that will actually um, allow the less friction and rubbing. And there are different ways, and you can even just take a screenshot of this if you want to save, but good ways to protect your skin um, from all the, the irritation of wearing masks frequently, because we have many months ahead, I'm sure. With that, I will end. This is my email address, and I encourage all of you to consider consulting dermatology for any complicated patients. Um, we do come to Norton, we go to UofL, and we have residents who are heavily involved, and we like to see these things. So thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Dr. Shatt. Appreciate the 